The chilling mystery of the 1983 murders of two women in Toronto, Canada had haunted the city and investigators for nearly four decades. The victims, Aaron Gilmore and Susan Tice, had their lives cut short, leaving behind a trail of unanswered questions and grieving families. For years, the case remained unsolved, causing profound anguish for those who sought justice. Then, in November of 2023, a breakthrough in the case occurred in the form of an arrest, shining long-awaited light on a dark chapter in Toronto's history. Yet, as the case finally unraveled and the truth emerged, unsettling questions continued to linger. Who was this perpetrator that managed to elude the clutches of justice for four decades? And why weren't they caught much sooner? This is Monsters. The 1980s marked a significant juncture in the history of Toronto, Canada, as the city underwent a series of profound transformations. The decade was characterized by a palpable air of change, with Toronto evolving from a traditional and relatively conservative city into a bustling metropolis that would eventually become one of the most culturally diverse in the world. However, alongside that vibrancy, the 1980s also saw its share of challenges, including a rise in urban crime. Instances of crime, including homicide, served as a stark reminder of the city's complexities and struggles. Toronto was not immune to the societal issues of the era, and law enforcement faced the daunting task of addressing criminal activities while also managing a growing population. It's within this multifaceted backdrop of transformation and challenges that the case of the 1983 murders of Susan Tice and Aaron Gilmore unfolded. At the age of 45, Susan Tice, a dedicated social worker, was a beloved mother to her four children, Ben, John, Christian, and Jason. Her career was an embodiment of her nurturing spirit as she tirelessly worked with disadvantaged children, making a profound impact on their lives. That profession wasn't just a job, it was a calling that resonated deeply with her compassionate nature. Inside the family dynamic, Susan was the vibrant thread that held them together. She was an artist, a musician, and an adventurer, and she used her passions to establish unique connections with each of her children. Susan introduced her children to the wonders of canoeing in the Yukon and exciting ski trips, creating cherished memories. She was undeterred in her commitment and love, even embarking on a cross-country road trip from Toronto to Calgary with her third child. Among her children, Christian, Susan's only daughter, was affectionately known as Mouse due to her shyness. Susan's gentle encouragement helped Christian overcome her inhibitions, leading her to embrace the world around her by signing her up for summer camps and fostering friendships with schoolmates and neighborhood children. Even as life presented its challenges, Susan was Christian's patient driving instructor, maintaining her composure even when the stick shift lessons became daunting. In 1983, Susan's life took a drastic shift when her marriage to her husband Fred ended and they decided to separate. The couple had lived a nomadic lifestyle, constantly relocating their family as Fred pursued career opportunities in the investment industry across various cities. Following their separation, Susan returned to Toronto and created a new home for herself on Gray Street. Christian, who was 16 at the time, was at summer camp and Susan took to writing her daughter letters while she was away. Just a few days after composing one of those letters, a tragedy would strike that would forever link Susan Tice to another woman, Aaron Gilmore. Aaron Gilmore was born into a loving family with her father, David Gilmore, and her mother, Anna McCowan Johnson. She was the middle child in the family with two brothers, Sean and Kaylin. Aaron's parents had separated, but she continued to maintain close relationships with both of them. Aaron's commitment to education and her desire to explore the world were prominent aspects of her life. She had aspirations to spend a year in Fiji and work as a teacher, a plan that was put on hold as she completed her education. Aaron was known to be an open-minded and adventurous individual, always eager to learn and explore new horizons. 
Her personality radiated warmth and charisma, drawing people to her. She had a natural ability to connect with others and create moments of joy evident in her planning of a surprise pink-themed party during a Toronto winter. Her interests included sketching and photography, often using her Nikon camera to capture the world around her. She was creative, artistic, and deeply appreciative of life's beauty. She shared a deep bond with her younger brothers, Sean and Kaylin, playing a pivotal role in both of their lives. Much like Susan Tice, Erin's family had an adventurous streak, and she and her mother Anna embarked on international journeys together. That included living in Greece for a few years. But at the age of 22, Erin Gilmore's life would be cut short in one of the most heinous ways imaginable. On the fateful evening of August 17, 1983, a planned dinner with Susan Tice, her sister and brother-in-law took a chilling turn when Susan failed to show up. Growing increasingly alarmed as attempts to reach her proved futile, her brother-in-law decided to pay her a visit. Upon entering Susan's home, he was greeted by a disconcerting sight, untouched mail piling up in her mailbox and an eerie stillness that pervaded the house. He made his way into the bedroom. Coincidentally, during this very moment, Susan's daughter Christian was seized by an inexplicable urge to contact her mother. What she hadn't anticipated was a man's voice on the other end of the line. Before Christian could utter a word, the person hung up. Christian would later learn that the man who answered the phone was her uncle, and he had just turned around and found Susan's dead body. She had been sexually assaulted and stabbed to death in her bed. Four months later, on December 20th, Erin Gilmore completed her shift at the shop where she worked, wrapping up her work at around 9 o'clock that evening. Her friend, Anthony Monk, had made arrangements to pick her up after work. Before heading to Erin's place, he stopped at a nearby bank to withdraw cash. Approximately 20 minutes later, he arrived at Erin's apartment building. As he approached her unit, he couldn't help but notice that the door to her apartment was slightly ajar. Anthony's concern grew as he took the stairs up to Aaron's apartment. He called out her name, but there was no response. A sense of unease hung in the air as he continued to search for her. It was then that he noticed a peculiar shape beneath the duvet on Aaron's bed. With a sense of dread, he gently pulled back the cover, only to make the horrifying discovery of Aaron's lifeless body. Like Susan, she had also been sexually assaulted and stabbed to death. The journey to justice for Susan Tyson and Aaron Gilmore was one marked by persistence, obstacles, and the relentless pursuit of answers. In the aftermath of Susan's murder, initial suspicions fell on her husband. However, as investigators dug deeper, they ruled him out as a suspect. The leads eventually dwindled, leaving the case shrouded in uncertainty. Aaron's murder, like Susan's, remained unsolved, and the cases went completely cold, leaving both families shattered by grief and unanswered questions. Two decades later, in 2003, a significant breakthrough came from an unexpected source. Gary Ellis, who had been involved in the initial investigation of Aaron Gilmore's murder, had taken on the role of head of homicide with the Toronto Police Service. Aaron's case had stayed with him, and when he inquired about the status of the case, what he discovered left him astounded. DNA evidence found in Aaron's apartment was linked to a sample from another unsolved murder that occurred just four months prior, Susan Tice. That DNA connection provided a glimmer of hope that the perpetrator might finally be identified. For some, including Christian, the revelation of a DNA link was met with a mixture of disappointment and hope. She couldn't help but notice the eerie similarities between Susan and Aaron's murders. Both lived alone, in close proximity, and had recently moved into their respective homes. Both were sexually assaulted and stabbed to death. The connection had been overlooked for many years. Aaron's brother Sean, on the other hand, turned to crime-solving TV shows like Law & Order and CSI. It was one such program that he first encountered the concept of genetic genealogy. The episode detailed how that innovative research method led to the arrest of Joseph D'Angelo, known as the Golden State Killer, who had eluded authorities for decades. Inspired by the potential of genetic genealogy, he contacted the Toronto police detective to inquire about whether that method could be employed in Aaron's case. The hunt for the killer was back on. 
a dedicated team began the painstaking journey of tracking down family members who matched the obtained DNA profile. Their quest for justice took them to individuals who may have already undergone DNA testing with private services like 23andMe, and they sought their willingness to contribute their DNA results to GEDmatch. In some cases, they had to approach people with a unique request, to have their DNA analyzed anew as part of a historical homicide investigation. As those profiles accumulated within GEDmatch, a vast familial tapestry began to take shape. Investigators wove together an intricate map comprising eight families encompassing over 3,000 names. The journey led them to families with deep roots in rural Canada, introducing a set of novel challenges. Family lineages proved intricate and perplexing, as genetic connections often suggested closer relationships than were truly the case. It was not uncommon to find individuals whose genetics implied first cousin status, only to discover they were in fact fourth cousins. The process of unraveling generations within these family trees became an intricate puzzle. By 2021, the lead investigator, Detective Sergeant Smith, was brimming with confidence that they were closing in on the elusive truth. That growing momentum allowed Sean, Aaron Gilmore's brother, to hold on to a newfound optimism, fueling the belief that the day of reckoning for his sister's killer was drawing nearer than ever before. On November 24, 2023, officers from the Toronto Police Service arrived at the home of 61-year-old Joseph George Sutherland. Their mission was clear, to serve him with a DNA warrant, a critical step in the pursuit of justice for the unsolved 1983 murders of Susan Tice and Aaron Gilmore. Typically, the police follow a well-worn path in their investigative efforts. They endeavor to surreptitiously collect a suspect's DNA, aiming to match it against the DNA evidence recovered from the scene. That covert approach serves to confirm their existing suspicions discreetly. However, in this case, their attempts to clandestinely obtain Joseph's DNA had proven unsuccessful. The legal team managed to present a compelling case before a judge, persuading them that it was not only reasonable but imperative to believe that Joseph could be the perpetrator of the 1983 killings. The execution of the DNA warrant became a pivotal necessity, a crucial tool to establish the truth. Joseph George Sutherland, one of five brothers, had now come under the spotlight. With unwavering determination, investigators had already cleared the other four brothers, meticulously eliminating them from the list of potential suspects. The process of elimination had led them to Joseph's door. Joseph was placed under arrest and charged with two counts of first-degree murder. The murders of Susan Tyson Aaron Gilmore stood as haunting mysteries for nearly four decades. Families were left to grapple with questions that seemed destined to remain unanswered. However, the relentless pursuit of justice, powered by advances in forensic science and innovative investigative techniques, ultimately brought a measure of closure to a case that had long defied resolution. The journey to unmask the killer of Susan Tyson Aaron Gilmore was fraught with challenges, marked by years of uncertainty and heartache. The families of the victims lived with the weight of their losses and the enduring pain of not knowing who had taken their loved ones away from them. Through meticulous work and a web of familial connections, the identity of Joseph George Sutherland was uncovered, marking a significant breakthrough in the case. Joseph's arrest was a momentous step towards closure for the families and a testament to the tenacity of law enforcement and genealogists who refused to let the cases fade into obscurity. Joseph George Sutherland pleaded guilty to the charges and his sentencing will take place next month in December of 2023. At the age of 61, he will likely spend the rest of his life in prison. The one unanswered question that investigators still have is, did Joseph commit any more crimes? Did he get away with other sexual assaults or murders? There are more than 750 unsolved homicides in Toronto dating back to the 1950s. Were any of those deaths at the hands of a monster like Joseph George Sutherland? We'll likely never know.
If you're a fan of true crime, hit subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss an episode. You can also hit like or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.